So in this video I'm going to tell you everything that I can think of about the antibiotic drug called Tazazin. Now, this is a brand name, one of the most famous brand names. It's the name that we more often use in the UK, at least, for the drug, rather than its full name. But I should tell you what its full name is, and its full name is Piperacillin Tazobactam. So it's a combination of two drugs. Um, Piperacillin is an antibiotic, specifically a penicillin antibiotic, and Tazobactam is a, a beta-lactamase inhibitor, and I'll tell you in just a moment what that is. So it's a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Firstly, though, let me just say, um, in case you're not aware, penicillin is not just one drug. There's a whole family of drugs that are all counted as penicillin antibiotics. So piperacillin is an extremely potent example of that family. So it's an extremely potent penicillin antibiotic. Now, this medication, Tazazin, is used a lot in the United Kingdom. I don't know about other countries, but in the UK we use it a lot. Uh, and it's not available in oral form. There is no tablet, Tazazin. It's only available as an intravenous medication, so it's only therefore given to people when they're extremely unwell and in hospital usually. Uh, it's not usually given as an ambulatory antibiotic either, so some people can have intravenous antibiotics on a daily basis, uh, and they can go home with some sort of uh, intravenous line in, and they can come in on a daily basis for their antibiotics, and that's done in cases where people have infections that require prolonged courses of antibiotics, such as uh, spinal infections, for example, discitis is the example that comes to mind immediately, but other sorts of bone infections as well, osteomyelitis can require extremely long courses of antibiotics and people don't generally want to stay in hospital for how long the course of antibiotics needs to be, uh, so they therefore have these ambulatory courses of antibiotics where they have a once a day regimen and therefore they just come in, have their antibiotic and then go home. Um, Tazazin is not used for that because it's required three times a day, um, you, or even four times a day it can be given and the dose is normally 4.5 grams intravenous um, three times a day. That's the normal dose. It can be stepped up in cases of really severe infections to four times a day, but we don't often do that. So back to the name then. So Tazazin is a brand name. Its proper name is Piperacillin Tazobactam. Other things you might hear it called, some people abbreviate Piperacillin Tazobactam down to pip Tazo. So you might hear it called that. You might also just hear it called Taz for short, or it has also kind of a joke name that people use, and that's to call it vitamin T. So, of course, there is no vitamin T, um, but um, because this is a very, very powerful antibiotic, it makes people better. Sometimes people jokingly refer to it as vitamin T. I'm going to cross that out because it's not an official name. It's just a, a joke name. Um, we can say, you know, that the patient is vitamin T deficient and it means that they've got a horrible infection and they need some tazadin to make them better. Um, so let's go back to the things that it contains. So it has piperacillin, which is a really potent form of penicillin. Let's talk about what a beta-lactamase inhibitor is, what tazobactam is. So this is kind of interesting. So bacteria have some bacteria have developed a resistance mechanism to penicillin antibiotics. So if I draw a little bacterial cell, let's say this is a bacterium, the way that they can become resistant to penicillin antibiotics, and indeed a broader class of antibiotics called beta-lactams, is to create an enzyme that is called beta-lactamase. So some bacteria make this enzyme, and this breaks down antibiotics that are in the group known as beta-lactams. So this is an even broader group of antibiotics of which the entire family of penicillins is part of. So there is a ring called the beta-lactam ring in chemistry. It's a chemical structure and all of these antibiotics that are in this class of beta-lactam antibiotics, they all have this same beta-lactam ring in their chemical structure. So penicillins are all examples of beta-lactams. Um, other examples are cephalosporins, 
such as kefuroxine, keftriaxone, keftazidine, kefalexin. They're some major examples of the kefalosporin antibiotic group. Carbapenems are another example. These are, again, medicines that you would only ever be put on if you were really ill in hospital. They're only available as intravenous form. Uh, so meropenem, ertapenem, imipenem, they're really, really potent antibiotics. Uh, even more powerful, in fact, than tazazin, uh, in some sense. Uh, so meropenem, for example, is often viewed as the strongest antibiotic that we often prescribe in hospitals in the UK. So when Tazazin. Tazazin is very good. We'll talk about that in a moment. Tazazin is a very, very good antibiotic. Uh, but if that doesn't work, it can be stepped up even further to meropenem, which is even broader uh, than Tazazin. And it's a carbapenem antibiotic. And then I'm trying to remember the final one. There is a final group here, um, which as Trianam is part of, and I can't remember what that group is called, but the group that contains the antibiotic as Trianam, which is I think very good at treating pseudomonas. It's not an antibiotic that I would ever prescribe of my own accord. It's something that I would be told to prescribe by a microbiologist on the basis of some blood culture result, usually. Um, anyway, that was a bit of a sidetrack. I can't remember what... Oh, actually, I can remember what this group is called. It's called the monobactams. So Astrianam is part of the group called monobactams. So, in fact, scrap that. It should be monobactams written there. So these are the four groups of antibiotics that are in this even larger group called beta-lactams. They are the penicillins, the cephalosporins, the carbapenems, and the monobactams. Uh, and they all have a chemical structure in common known as the beta-lactam ring. And the problem is that some bacteria have developed resistance mechanisms to all of these antibiotics uh, by making an enzyme that breaks down the beta-lactam ring, and that's called the beta-lactamase enzyme. Now, a way that we can try and overcome that is we can put, with our beta-lactam antibiotic, something that inhibits this enzyme, and this is exactly what a beta-lactamase inhibitor is, and tazobactam is an example. So it will go and bind to this enzyme. I don't know if it actually binds in, you know, the active site of the enzyme. So this picture is something that often people draw for enzymes, and this is referring kind of like to the active site of the enzyme. This is where the drug would come in and it would be broken down in this. It's called the active site of an enzyme. So often inhibitors will bind at the active site and therefore stop the enzyme from working. I don't specifically know whether tazobactam does bind to the active site. It's plausible that it could bind somewhere else and still break the enzyme and stop it from functioning. Uh, but just for the sake of having a simple picture, uh, this is what um, tazobactam does. It binds to this enzyme and stops it from working. Therefore, even these bacteria that might have been resistant to piperacillin um, because of the production of the beta-lactamase enzyme, if we put it in combination with tazobactam, the tazobactam will inhibit the beta-lactamase enzymes and then the penicillin, the piperacillin, will still be able to kill the bacteria. Now, I'm not an expert anymore in exactly how penicillin kills bacteria. I used to know this in a huge amount of detail when I was an undergraduate student, uh, but now I can only tell you the basics of what it does. So bacteria have like a cell wall outside their cell membrane. They have a much stronger structure called their cell wall, which I'm sort of demonstrating here in white. And this is really important for holding the cell together. And penicillin I think, blocks one of the enzymes that's involved in making that cell wall, because the cell wall has to be continually repaired and turned over, and so it it's not the case that the bacteria just makes its cell wall and then it's got it. It has to continue maintaining it effectively, you know, like continually painting one of those huge bridges that people often talk about, where it's a continuous job, it never ends. Um, so they're always using enzymes to continue the maintenance of this cell wall, and I believe penicillin blocks one of those enzymes, and what ends up happening is the cell wall then breaks down, it stops being maintained and it breaks down, and the cell just, I think, falls apart because of the lack of the cell wall that's holding it together, um, so the cells therefore die when they're exposed to penicillin. So that's a little bit. My literal understanding of the pharmacology of piperacillin tazobactam. Let's now talk a little bit more about clinically what we actually do with this drug, when we actually use it, what sort of infections we use to treat. So I would say it's used to treat a lot of different types of infections, but the main one uh, would be pneumonia. 
it's often viewed as like the gold standard antibiotic for treating pneumonia. So let me firstly just make sure everyone knows what pneumonia is. Pneumonia is an infection of the lungs. So you have your respiratory tract. If we have our, I'm going to try drawing a little person here. It's a little stick man. So um, here is the mouth and nose, and they lead down into the pharynx, which then goes into the larynx and the trachea, and then the trachea goes into the bronchi and the bronchioles and then the lungs. So when you like get a viral infection, say flu or some cold virus, it comes in, you breathe it in, either through your mouth or your nose, more likely your nose, and then it usually starts its infection up in your nose and then it can spread backwards to your throat and maybe it can spread down to your larynx and your trachea and it can gradually become a more and more severe infection the further it gets down so if it just gets to your nose it's a very mild infection you'll get a runny nose um, maybe a blocked nose maybe lose your sense of smell that was famous in covid that it would make you lose your sense of smell from causing nasal infections um, if it goes back to your throat your pharynx you'll get a sore throat if it goes to your larynx you'll lose your voice Potentially, if it goes down to your trachea, you get a really horrible barking cough. And then if it gets into your airways, that's where it gets more nasty. It can cause sort of like difficulty breathing because the airways tend to constrict like in a sort of asthma kind of attack. That's sort of what can happen in bronchitis that might cause problems breathing. And then if it gets into the actual lung tissue, that's really, really bad. And that's uh, then what we call pneumonia. Um, and, you know, we've seen this with the worldwide pandemic that we've just had some people when they got covid would just get nasal infections they were the lucky ones and in fact the majority of people just got sort of upper respiratory tract infections some people got you know worse upper respiratory tract infections they get really bad sore throats or they lose their voice or they get a barking cough uh, and then other people got really really ill from it and those people who got really really ill it was because the virus got down into their lungs and caused coronavirus pneumonia um, flu can also cause pneumonia, influenza pneumonia. Often what happens is it might start off as a viral infection, but then bacteria infect the lungs secondarily. So you often get bacterial pneumonia rather than just sole viral pneumonia. And there are other rarer types of pneumonia as well. Fungi can infect the lungs as well. That's much rarer. It usually happens in people who are immunosuppressed, either uh, from hematological malignancies or from chemotherapy, uh, from uh, whatever, for treating either a hematological malignancy or some other type of malignancy. Or if you're on an immunosuppressant for some sort of rheumatological condition or other sort of autoimmune condition like methotrexate, or if you've got um, some sort of genetic um, or to, uh, genetic immunodeficiency, or if you've got uh, HIV that is not treated and is causing immunodeficiency, uh, what once would have been called AIDS, but which rarely is called that anymore. Uh, we don't, this is another aside, but often we don't use the term AIDS anymore because uh, AIDS was used in the 1980s when... Um, there was no treatments that could reverse it. So once you had the immunodeficiency caused by HIV, it was irreversible and therefore they diagnosed them with AIDS. Whereas now, with the treatment for HIV, if you put people on drugs, even if it has caused immunodeficiency, if you, i.e. a low CD4 count, if you put people on the drugs, it gets better and the CD4 count improves and their immunodeficiency goes away and their immune system recovers. Uh, so it's, it's not a, a term that is tend to be used anymore because we can reverse it now. Uh, so it's, I, th I think they tend to use advanced HIV infection rather than uh, AIDS. But if you did have advanced HIV infection, what would have once been called AIDS, uh, that would be uh, something that would put you at risk of fungal pneumonias. Anyway, the main type of pneumonia is bacterial pneumonia, and that is what we treat with Antibiotics, for example, tazazin would be an excellent choice of antibiotic to treat bacterial pneumonia. And as I say, even though the infection of the respiratory tract might have started off as a viral infection that got down into the actual lungs, it very quickly becomes the case that the, bacteri the secondary bacterial infection takes over and it makes the person really, really ill. So even though the antibiotic will have no effect 
on the viral infection, it will help treat the secondary bacterial infection. Sometimes bacterial pneumonia just occurs of its own accord without a preceding um, a, a, a viral infection because of course we are all the time breathing bacteria into our lungs you know our throat is colonized by bacteria it's not a sterile place at the back of our throat so some of those bacteria are you know carried along with the air that we breathe in and therefore do get down to our lungs so our lungs are continuously having to clear up these bacteria that get breathed in and if for some reason, it doesn't manage to do that. If you're, for example, under great physiological strain at the moment, if you've maybe injured yourself massively, you know, if elderly people have bores, that would be an example of a massive physiological strain. They injure their body, and classically, in the recovery period of that, they might get pneumonia because their body's not able to defend itself as well as it would normally because they're... Um, strained by the injury that they've sustained at the time. So bacterial pneumonia can occur primarily or it can be secondary to a viral infection. So with regards to how we diagnose pneumonia, these people come in usually struggling to breathe, so they'll have increased work of breathing, uh, they'll say I feel breathless, uh, they'll be coughing a lot, they might be spiking temperatures. The way we then confirm it as a diagnosis, uh, well, clinically we can listen to their lungs and we might hear crackles in the parts that are infected, or we might hear wheeze if the airways are indeed constricted because of the uh, infection. Uh, but the way that we would confirm it is we take a chest x-ray, uh, and usually on the chest x-ray, I'll draw a little sort of picture. Um, this is kind of, oh, actually, it's, it's reasonable. So you, you, things that are dense, show up black, sorry, show up white on an x-ray, and things that are not dense show up black. So the lungs, when they are full of air, uh, should are not dense, and therefore show up quite black on the x-ray. You see the ribs sort of over, little sort of white uh, marks overlying uh, the darker lungs. The heart, which is full of blood, is much denser, so it sort of shows up white. And then if you've got a portion of lung that is infected, it becomes much denser because of all the inflammatory exudate that has accumulated in that portion of the lung. So you might get a sort of white splodge, like maybe like that, on a chest x-ray, and we call this consolidation. Um, and that's how we confirm pneumonia uh, radiologically. So at that point, once we've got their chest x-ray on admission, uh, we would say, ah, now we know the reason this person is breathless, they've got pneumonia. We'd also do blood tests, and the blood tests can indicate to us that the person has an infection somewhere in the body. So the things that we would measure are their white blood cells and usually their CRP. So white blood cells are the type of cell that's in your blood that fights infection. It's produced by the bone marrow and when you've got an infection at the moment it goes massively up. Uh, so normal levels for white blood cells to be between is 2.5 and 7.5 and I think it's like, oh, do I want to dare give what this actually means? Um, I think it's times 10 to the power of 9. So this is the bit that I don't usually read because I know, the, you know, I know the normal range. Uh, I'm just trying to remember what it actually really does mean. I think it's times 10 to the 9, and then is it per milliliter or per liter? This is where I'm going to get it wrong. Um, oh, I'm going to go per liter, because I think that would be an awful lot to have per milliliter. Um, but don't, don't take that as gospel there. That might be wrong. Um, so, the normal level would be to have between 2.5 and 7.5 billion, and I think it's per litre. As I say, I don't normally look at this bit because I just know that it should be between 2.5 and 7.5. Um, I think it probably is per litre. Anyway, so this is the number. There is a, the, the important thing to know is that there is a normal range of white blood cells that you should have within your blood, which all of us, if we measured it right now, would have uh, in our blood. In infection, it goes up massively. So, for example, it might go up to 20, 30, you can even get it up to 40. Uh, the higher it goes, the worse the infection, um, or the bigger the response, at least, to the infection. Uh, younger people often are going to be capable of launching a larger response than older people. So, if you see a massively high one in a young person, uh, it 
might not actually indicate that they're more sick than the older person who, ha who hasn't got quite as big response. It might be that the older person's actually either, even though their white cell count isn't so high, just because their body isn't capable of launching uh, that level of response that the younger person's was in terms of rise in white blood cells. CRP also, again, I'm tr can I remember the units for this? Gosh, I don't know if I can. It should be less than 10. What is the range I know is normal. I'm trying to remember what the actual units of this are. It might be something like milligrams per litre, but again, don't quote me on that. Um, check. And also the thing is, you know, all over the world, they will use different units. Uh, so it doesn't actually really necessarily matter. You need to know in your hospital what you well, not necessarily what units, but what is the normal range. And usually, you know, it will tell you what the normal range is next to it so that you can you don't even need to know them. You can see whether it's in the normal range or not. But uh, certainly in the English units, CRP should be less than 10, whatever they are. And I think they're probably this, but I wouldn't bet my life on it. Uh, so CRP is a protein that is created by the liver and it is involved in fighting infection. So when you have an infection, the liver starts churning out much, much more and it goes ma it level goes massively up in the blood also. So we term both of these together, the white blood cell counts and the CRP, we, we call them the inflammatory markers because they are markers of inflammation within the body. Not necessarily infection, but markers of inflammation. Usually that inflammation is being caused by infection, but sometimes in other types of diseases, such as autoimmune diseases or other inflammatory diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, uh, which I don't think is believed to be an autoimmune disease, strictly speaking, but is an inflammatory disease nonetheless. And I think it's believed that it's um, a failure of tolerance to the commensals that should normally live in your gut. So we all have bacteria that live perfectly happily in our gut and help us digest things. Uh, if you your immune system is supposed to ignore them, but if your immune system stops ignoring them and tries to fight them, I think that's believed to be what happens in inflammatory bowel disease. So it's not an autoimmune disease because your your immune system isn't attacking your own body, uh, but it is a inflammatory disease, a failure of the immune system to tolerate normal commensals. Anyway, uh, that's a sidetrack. So white blood cells and CRP, they're known as the inflammatory markers. When they're high, it means that inflammation is going on somewhere in the body, and often that inflammation is being caused by infection. Um, so CRPs, you can see them go up to like 200 would be a sporting CRP. It can go up to 300. Above that is really quite an extreme response, but you can see it go up to 400. You can even see it go up to 500. I've seen it once, I think, go up to 600. Beyond that, I don't know if I've ever seen it go beyond 600, uh, but it can get quite high. 300, though, is a very raised CRP. That's a, you know, they've got a good going infection if they've got a CRP of 300. Even 200 is a good going CRP. So we'd take an x-ray, we'd do our blood tests, and this is how we'd confirm the diagnosis, and then we'd diagnose them with pneumonia. And then do we put them on Tazazin straight away? No, is the answer. Unless they're really, really sick, then we can sometimes go straight to Tazazin. But actually, in my hospital, the antibiotics that we're supposed to start with are amoxicillin, which is another form of penicillin. So we're supposed to start with amoxicillin two grams um, three times a day intravenously. If they're really sick, we're supposed to give it intravenously. We could give it orally if they weren't so sick. And then we're supposed to give another antibiotic alongside it, which is doxycycline. Uh, and we would give usually, we'd give a loading dose of 200 milligrams for the first dose. And then we'd give after that 100 milligrams uh, once a day orally. Uh, doxycycline is an antibiotic that isn't available as intravenous form. Uh, it's only available as oral form. Now, the guidelines will be different in different hospitals. So in my previous hospital, this was not what we were supposed to treat pneumonia with. In my previous hospital, we used a different regimen, but it's kind of equivalent. So the regimen that I had in my previous hospital was, we used Ben Pen, actually, uh, which is another form of penicillin, benzyl penicillin. Uh, can I remember the dose of this? I think it was 1.2 grams four times a day intravenously. And then we'd give clarithromycin as the additional agent. 
and we try to give that orally, although chlorophyllomycin can be given intravenously if you really must. It's not a good thing to give intravenously because it's really not nice to the veins. It tends to burn the veins as it's going through, as it can cause phlebitis. It's not, so we tend to avoid it massively giving it intravenously, but you can give it intravenously, but try to give it orally. Um, so chlorophyllomycin is 500 milligrams twice a day uh, orally. Uh, and these would usually be carried on for seven days, usually, unless the patient gets better quicker, in which case they could be stepped down sooner. So these two regimens are kind of equivalent because amoxicillin kind of hits the same things as Ben Penn does, and indeed the same sort of things as Tazazin does. They're, these are all extremely good at hitting a bacterium called, and I apologise for the sirens, I can't do anything about that, but they'll pass, uh, pneumococcus. So the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia is this bug called pneumococcus, uh, which has a proper name. It's called streptococcus pneumoniae, or strep pneumoniae in full. Um, so penicillin antibiotics are really, really good at hitting strep pneumoniae. So all of these three different penicillins, Ben, Pen, Amoxicillin, Taz, they all hit strep pneumoniae. Whereas doxycycline and chlorophyllomycin, they are also good against strep pneumoniae, but the main reason they're being added, added in is to hit other types of bugs that Ben, Pen and Amox wouldn't hit alone. Uh, so they're what we call the atypical bugs for pneumonia. Um, so examples, the, the main example that people often use is Legionella, uh, which I have seen before. I've seen legion, confirmed Legionella pneumonia where we did tests specifically to identify whether the person had Legionella and they came back positive. Uh, you do a urinary test, bizarrely. I think uh, it's a urinary antigen test for Legionella. So something, when you have this infection, it's a specific type of bacteria called Legionella. When you have it infecting the lungs, causing Legionella pneumonia, something that it produces must be, must get into your blood and then your kidneys filter it out and then it ends up in your urine. So we do a urinary test for whether the person has Legionella and it tests for whatever that stuff is. Um, so I've seen cases of Legionella pneumonia, and Legionella, I don't think, is hit by penicillin antibiotics, so that's the purpose of putting people on these drugs, because it's not unheard of, Legionella pneumonia. It is something that happens. Um, there are other atypicals as well. I'm trying to think of some other ones. So mycoplasma uh, is an example of another atypical. Uh, and then there are ones that can be caught from birds as well. Uh, can I remember what they're called? Psittacosis. Like, if people have pet birds, they can get uh, a type of pneumonia called psittacosis. Uh, mycoplasma pneumonia, I think, is... Um, I think that one's common in pe people who drink too much alcohol, uh, if I remember rightly. Anyway, the point is that there are a bunch of other bugs, other than the main bugs that cause pneumonia, that can also cause pneumonia. And they're not vanishingly rare, so we put people on these adjunct drugs to, because they are good at hitting these other bugs that the penicillin alone wouldn't hit. And these adjunct drugs also hit the main bugs that cause pneumonia. And I should just say, we would call streptococcal pneumonia typical pneumonia, and there are a bunch of other bugs that are also counted as typical causes of pneumonia. So Moraxella is one, and Haemophilus is one. Um, and I think these are also hit generally by the penicillin antibiotics, but they're also hit by these adjunct ones. So the attack will be strengthened by these as well. So we have typical pneumonia and atypical pneumonia. Uh, the penicillin is generally going after the typical pneumonias and is extremely strong against those typical pneumonias, but doesn't hit the atypical pneumonias. And therefore we tend to add on this adjunct drug as well, which hits the atypicals, but also helps with the fight against the typical ones. So, what then, these would be the sort of starting things that you would put someone on. As I say, in my current hospital, it would be this. We'd start them on a MOX and DOX. And very recently, you know, I've seen a lot of, well, not very recently, but months ago, when we had a lot of corona patients, uh, you would see people coming in with coronavirus pneumonia. And 
we'd cover them for secondary bacterial pneumonia. So we'd start them on the MOX, DOX, and then to help with the coronavirus pneumonia, we'd put them on dexamethasone, a steroid as well, which isn't something we tend to do uh, outside of coronavirus pneumonia, but it's something that seemed to really help in coronavirus pneumonia. So, you know, I'd write amox, dox, and dex uh, on the plan. Uh, amox short for amoxicillin, dox for doxycycline, and then dex is short for dexamethasone. Anyway, so when does tazazin come in? If someone comes in really, really sick, so sick that you think they're going to die, uh, then you can start them immediately on tazazin rather than going with the uh, normal starting combination of antibiotics. And again, you'd want an atypical cover as well, so you'd often start them on tazazin and doxycycline if they're able to take uh, an oral drug, or tazazin and chlorofromycin you could have, and then if they weren't able to take the oral, then they could have the intravenous chlorofromycin. Some people might not be able to take oral because they might be so ill from the infection that they might actually be kind of in a comatose state, uh, so therefore they're not able to actually take a tablet upon command because they're not rousable. Um, so you can start immediately with tazazin rather than going for these weaker penicillins. So uh, ben Pen and Amoxicillin, they are fantastic drugs, but they're not as broad spectrum as Tazazin. So Taz hits things that Amox and Ben Pen don't hit. Uh, a lot of other bugs. These are fantastic at hitting pneumococcus, but there are things that this hits that they don't. An example would be, for, exa for example, a bug called Pseudomonas is hit by Tazazin, which is not hit. Uh, by Ben Pen or Amoxicillin, or indeed Chlorophomycin and Doxycycline, they don't hit Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is kind of a green slime, it, well, it's a bug that forms green slime, and people can get pseudomonal infections in their lungs. Usually it's people with structural abnormalities, so people with bronchiectasis, which is where the airways aren't a normal size, instead they're really, really dilated, um, and they can form sort of like cystic pockets, so Normally, your airways should be like, let's say, this. Um, oh, that's that's not how they should be. Uh, so nice and nice and normal size here. In people with bronchiectasis, instead, it would be like their airways would be much bigger, and they might have huge sort of cystic pockets off the side, and these things are really at risk of getting infected. And Pseudomonas loves to live in those sort of things. So. People with bronchiectasis can get pseudomonal infections in the lungs, and these are usually really, really difficult to get rid of uh, and need antibiotics that hit pseudomonas, anti-pseudomonal antibiotics, so tazazin is an example of that. But there's other things that Amox and Ben Pen wouldn't hit that Taz does hit, so it's a much broader spectrum antibiotic, a more powerful antibiotic, if you like. So let's say someone comes in with pneumonia, but they, they may be very unwell, uh, they may be requiring oxygen, they've got a big splodge of consolidation in one of their lungs, let's say, their inflammatory markers are through the roof, so they're coming into hospital, but let's say they're up and talking and it looks as though they're going to get better, that's the sort of patient we'd probably start on a mox and dox initially. Let's say things don't go so well and things start to go downhill, we might then look at stepping up the antibiotics and Often, the antibiotics might go through an intermediate stage of being stepped up before you get to tazazin. So it might go from amox and dox to coamox and dox first, and then be stepped up again to taz and dox if that doesn't work. So coamox is uh, another very famous antibiotic, another famous penicillin antibiotic. Coamox, its famous brand name is Augmentin. It's full name is coamoxiclav, its even fuller name is amoxicillin clavulonate, uh, and it's similar to um, tazazin in that it's a combination of two drugs, so it's amoxicillin that we've already seen, which is a penicillin antibiotic, and then clavulonate is another beta-lactamase inhibitor, so it's amoxicillin with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So it's kind of a step up from amox and dox to coamox and dox. Uh, and you might say, well, why don't we go for these antibiotics straight away? Why don't why bother with amoxicillin and doxycycline when you could go immediately to coamoxiclav and doxycycline? Coamoxiclav, though, can have horrible side effects that are less likely 
with this combination, much less likely if you just give amoxicillin. So there's a horrible infection that you can get from antibiotics called C. diff, um, short for Clostridium difficile. I'll write its name out in full. So this is a bacterium that normally lives in our gut, in our colon in particular, in small amounts, but the problem is if you take antibiotics that kill all of the other bugs in the gut but don't kill Clostridium difficile, then all of its competition is gone and it can totally overpopulate down there and it can cause really bad problems. So it can cause a horrible gastroenteritis effectively, uh, a GI infection, so Clostridial gastroenteritis that can take weeks to months to get better. Um, and even worse than that, it can actually cause such a severe infection that it can cause the actual colon to start dying inside of you. It, it can cause the colon to get extremely large uh, and then actually start to die. And that's called megacolon when that occurs, a toxic megacolon. Uh, so it can be really, really horrible infection. Uh, you know, that will, that, that will be something that either kills you or the only way we're going to stop it from killing you is by major surgery to remove your whole colon, basically, or at least the part of the colon that's been massively affected by this infection. Uh, and that's a complication that can happen. Now, often, you know, C. diff infections don't lead to toxic megacolon. They just lead to a horrible gastroenteritis normally, but it's still a horrible gastroenteritis that really can knock people you know, knock people down uh, and takes can take weeks for them to get back to normal. Uh, and that's a side effect that Augmentin is kind of famous for causing that. It's the drug that most commonly, or, or most C. diff cases that occur in the UK, uh, it's traceable to Augmentin. Because Augmentin, it's not the worst antibiotic for causing C. diff. There are ones that are worse. Uh, the Cephalosporins, in fact, are worse. Uh, Ciprofloxacin is worse. Clindamycin is usually viewed as being the worst, uh, worst of them all. Uh, the terrible Cs, they're called. They all begin with C. Cephalosporins, Clindamycin, Ciprofloxacin, and Kermoxiclav. Uh, but Kermoxiclav is the one that is most prescribed of all of those. It's a very, very common drug to be prescribed, whereas those other ones are much less commonly prescribed. So most cases, therefore, of C. diff are caused by augmentin, and that's why we're more scared of this drug, whereas amoxicillin, I, I've certainly never seen a case of C. diff caused by amoxicillin. Tazazin is actually believed to be less bad for causing C. diff than coamoxiclav, but it's still worse than amoxicillin for causing it. So these heavier duty antibiotics, they do come along with worse side effects potentially, which is why there's something to be said for starting with this and then only stepping up if it becomes necessary. Okay, so I think that about exhausts everything that I want to say about this drug. We've gone over what it is, we've gone over its dosing um, and what it would be used to treat. I suppose I should just say that Pneumonia is not the only thing it can be used to treat. There are other things it can be used to treat. Um, often, if I was using it to treat another type of infection, it, it might be that the person has um, pneumonia as well. So say if they have a pneumonia and they have a urinary infection, we could treat that with tazazin. It might not be your first choice of treatment. Augmentin might be your first choice, but if that doesn't work, you might step it up to tazazin. It's not something that I would initiate, for example, for a urinary tract infection alone as my first line drug. Like, it's, it's not something that I would think of immediately, let's do tazazin. If the urine had been sent off to the microbiologist and they had grown a specific bug and they found that it is fantastically sensitive to tazazin, then they often will tell us that and say, change the patient to tazazin. And that's the more common case where I use it to treat things other than pneumonia, i.e., if I'm using it to treat something other than pneumonia, it would usually be because a microbiologist has told me that uh, they've got some cultures that say tazazin is the stuff that we should be using here. Um, it's, 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 it's just there are other drugs that I think of first for other types of infections rather than tazazin, whereas tazazin is a pneumonia antibiotic in my head. But as I say, it hits a huge number of different bugs that so can be used to treat a broad range of infections. So we will end there. Thank you very much for watching.